open the meeting, uh, joint meeting between the planning board, um, the zoning board, the board of selectmen, KMP, um, law attorney Joe Bard is here uh, to present and facilitate a joint meeting of the board uh, of selectmen and these other two boards. And the purpose of this meeting is to impact new information and update on the various applicable laws that have changed and to establish an efficient and proper communications between <coughs> process between the boards. Mr. Bard's proposed agenda for the evening, um, he's going to talk about um, a discussion about basic requirements for open meeting law, conflict of interest law, public records law, and the coordination among boards, which would be just general, Chapter 40B, comprehensive permits, and dialogue uh, amongst the boards. So we could probably start with... Bill, can I just ask you a question? My name is Becky Coletta, and I'm the chair of the Coordinating Board. I'm a little confused as to this meeting. I had originally asked for the meeting with the ZBA and the Town Council. And now we're sort of here in this more formal setting and with a slightly different agenda than what we had talked about. So I'm just trying to get the lay of the land as to what the goal is here. Um, is it to sort of go through how to hold public meetings, or is it to go through sort of some of the nuances of the zoning bylaws and how we're going to deal with the fact that we have two independent boards with different functions that sometimes touch on the same matters? So maybe Joel could answer that, because that's... Um, I mean, it's it's what it's what I have in front of me. Evidently, you had requested it, um, and it was set up that these basic requirements are talked about um, about the open <coughs> meeting law, conflict of interest, and in public records, and also about coordination among the boards. And if there's anything you want to add to it after he does his presentation, I'm sure you will have an opportunity to get up and talk about it. And I can, do you want me to get up and, and sure. explain what, uh, yep. so we have a, a handout here, the, so I had, I guess, Becky, we should have spoken here. Um, it, it might have been helpful, Becky, if we'd spoken, but I think what I'm intending to do here uh, tonight is consistent with what you had wanted to accomplish. So the idea is, um, and Ed warned me to go light on this first part, but I thought, and I know, now how many of you are from the zoning board? I, just, just one of you? Two. Oh, two, oh, good, oh. Um, sort of the door. Uh, but. We're, we're low in numbers right now. Anyway. Yes, um, well, yeah, it's too bad. I was hoping all of the zoning board members were new, because I gather that the three full board members are brand new, is that correct? I gather the three full zoning board members are brand new. No. No? Okay. Okay, well that's fine. So Yeah, okay. yeah, he's on vacation. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just go over some basics that everybody should be aware of, but the focus will be to hopefully, unfortunately, don't really have the zoning board here. Um, and I understand. Well, what, yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, one of our concerns is that we don't have enough communication. Right. And it's <coughs> Hard that this is being videoed. Everything that's learned tonight, at least, can be shared and it can still the dialogue. But I think the thing that's been lacking is the dialogue. Sure. sure. And that's and that's what we were hoping to sort of have. But maybe this is kind of a formal setting for that anyway. So maybe we'll have a follow up. Well, yeah, perhaps. But Christina's here, and this will be a good opportunity for Christina anyway to get a sense of what ideally the board's could aspire to do going forward. So, but let me start in through these, because I, uh, since we don't get together that often, uh, that'd be useful to just refresh on this. I said, I, I don't intend to dwell on it. You've got a copy of all of the slides here. 
And um, so, how do I? Uh, I was that's say it. I it off to oh, great, good. Okay. So, all right, and that's a disclaimer. You can read the disclaimer, but <laughs> we're not giving you legal advice here. Can, am I in the way of no. the board now? Um, all right. So the open. So we're starting with the open meeting law. I think the first couple of bullet points. Um, you understand. The, the last point, the public records law, and of course the open meeting law do tie in, but under the public records law, virtually any record created or received by a government employee or an official is a public record by definition. So pretty much anything you touch, unless it's marked confidential for some reason, is a public record. Okay. By the way, this I should introduce Nicole Costanzo, who's been with us for about three years now, who's uh, uh, extremely helpful in... Uh, all of this stuff. So here are the citations for the open meeting law. The, uh, it was revised significantly and, and took effect, the revisions took effect in 2010. The most significant aspect of the revisions actually wasn't so much the changes in the law, but it used to be, and those of us who've been around for a while remember, that the open meeting law was enforced by the different district attorney's office around the state. and. So you would get different readings from different district attorney's offices, and some were more aggressive about enforcing it, and others were not so much. And all of that got moved and centralized into the attorney general's office, and there's a division of open government that's actually extremely vigilant about it. And um, so we're getting a lot of rulings from them, and we cite to a couple of them here in these materials. So it's definitely a much more formal uh, situation now, and it's enforced much more rigorously. Okay, next slide. Um, so the central concept, if you will, of the open meeting law is that any deliberation has to happen in open. And the deliberation, as you can see, is a or deliberation by a public body, which was, I'm sorry, it's a meeting. Deliberation is also defined. So this is the definition of meeting, is a deliberation by a public body with respect to any matter within the body's jurisdiction with certain exceptions. So a site visit is not a meeting, uh, so long as the members do not deliberate. So you're going to a site and you're all there, and it's perfectly legal, it, it's um, posted first at town hall, but, and by the way, it's often on private property. Sometimes you're out on the public way, but because you're on private property and because it's not a public meeting, the public may not be invited. The applicant, for whatever reason, may not want the public there, so the public is not necessarily invited to join the members of the board on the site visit. Um, but the board members can't deliberate. You can point things out and say, oh, you know, look at that, and then when you get back in the meeting, say, oh, the reason I pointed out that geological feature is because of the water, uh, you know, water flow con concerns I might have. So as a planning board, typically we do notice a meeting for on-site inspections. Um, and that, as I understand it, does give us the right to deliberate if we choose to do so at the site visit. That is correct if the public is allowed onto the property and if you're deliberating in a space where the public is invited. Yeah, we've always, um, we've never had an applicant request that the public not attend. Okay, good. I, and we would address it, I guess, if that came up, but we haven't had that situation. Right. So that works, and then it's a regular... And then we can deliberate because it's a regular meeting. Yes, 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 if you posted it and, and the public is welcome, and if they're welcome and don't show up, you can still deliberate. I mean, it's, you've advertised it. Um, uh, a meeting does not include attendance by a quorum of the body at a public or private gathering or social event, so long as the members don't deliberate. So it may be that four members of the Board of Selectmen show up at a Chamber of Commerce event, that's fine, it's not a meeting, but you don't want to be seen all clustered four of you around, uh, seeming, even if you're not, seeming to be discussing town business. And obviously, if you're having a social conversation, that's fine, but same obviously for, for any other board member. But you can't deliberate about public business. Um, and if a quorum of a body happens to be, so if three members of the planning board show up at a, uh, sorry, three members of the board of selectmen show up at a planning board public hearing, let's say, about a zoning change because it's something of some interest, that's fine. You don't need to post a meeting, but you, you three members of the Board of Selectmen shouldn't be 
deliberating about the subject matter. If you get up to speak, you want to make clear you're not speaking as a selectman, you're speaking as, as an interested citizen. Or you don't have to say anything, you just get up, get up and say, I'm a selectman. Um, <clears throat> Whereas in this setting where it's an inner board meeting, we all noticed it separately. You've posted it, right. Uh, the last point, so what we call a ministerial act or an administrative act, such as signing documents, may take place outside of a meeting. So the best example is uh, you vote a license, uh, you vote a special permit, a variance, whatever it might be, and the final version is not available at the meeting. So board members can stop in a town hall over the next couple of days and sign the document. Uh, and that can, that's what we call a ministerial function. That doesn't have to happen at the meeting, assuming, of course, that at the meeting, the board voted the decision and uh, whatever conditions and so forth were all clearly understood, and it was just a matter of having it formalized onto a piece of paper, and then you can show up and sign it at a town hall on your own time. Okay, so now we have deliberation. <clears throat> so it's an oral, now, a lot of these terms haven't changed, but their significance has changed enormously with social media. Um, so deliberation is an oral, excuse me, <clears throat> an oral or written communication through any medium, obviously any medium now means social media or, or just individual emails or text messages, uh, including electronic mail between or among a quorum of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction with certain exceptions. Now provided that so the exceptions include that provided, the, the, the bold here is introduction to the bullets that follow. So provided that no opinions of governmental body are expressed, deliberation specifically excludes distribution by a member of the public body of a meeting agenda, of scheduling of procedural information, reports or documents that may be discussed at an upcoming meeting. So you can send those documents out. So the most, um, the one around which we get the most questions are the last one. Reports or documents that may be discussed at an upcoming meeting, so long as the material does not express the ideas, feelings, beliefs, opinions of a member of the body. So um, the classic example is if the um, board, let's say it's the planning board's acted on a special permit, and um, or, or the zoning board, uh, special permit or variance, and um, at the end of the meeting, uh, I'm tapped to write the, not me as town council, but me as a member of the board, tapped to write the decision, or any one of you is. And so you send the decision out to all of the members of the board for the board to have and have an opportunity to review and mark up for when you're actually going to meet. So that's fine. It's just a distribution of the document. What's not fine, then, is for so-and-so to start emailing either me individually or, God forbid, the whole board and say, no, the fourth paragraph has to read thus and such. That becomes a deliberation. And you might say, you might point out that the, um, this talks about a deliberation um, between or among a quorum of the public body. So a five-member board, if it's just an email, between Dan and Lou, that's only two people, that's not a quorum. And so yes, technically that's not a deliberation. But the problem comes that as soon as either Dan or Lou brings Bill in, then you've got a quorum. So, and obviously with your seven member planning board, it's gonna take more of you to reach that point. But it's just very dangerous, it's just too easy with email, really, to, to before you know it, have had a discussion among three people, or four people. Um, so, or with the zoning board, it just takes two people to do it. So, uh, to, to have a quorum. So, it's okay to get the documents out, but then any discussion has to be reserved for when the whole board meets. Okay, next slide. And uh, practical considerations, well, main thing is beware of reply to all, and you know, limit the use of email just to scheduling and getting documents out. Okay. Um, now, Another part of the open meeting law that uh, did not change very significantly, but has been considerably refined, has been uh, the meeting, the Attorney General's opinions on meeting notices. 
so I'm getting a stiff neck here, so I'm going to just read from my slide. Um, a little bit harder to read. Um, so, of course, you know it has to be posted 48 hours in advance, uh, excluding Saturdays. The reason Saturdays is underlined is the old open meeting law, um, Saturdays were not excluded. So that's why now for your Monday meetings, you have to get the notice out on Thursday because before Friday counted and Saturday, well, no, I'm sorry, you got, you got um, uh, Monday counts, of course. But um, but any of it, so you don't, you don't get to count Saturday. So for a Monday meeting, it's got to be two work days earlier. Um, but the, uh, so the notice must take the date and time. And you can revise it if need be. Something may come up and you revise it. But the revised notice has to have the, the more recent date on it. Next slide. So the content is what has become really refined by the Attorney General. So the notice has to include a listing of topics that the chair reasonably anticipates will be discussed. Um, so this requirement has been interpreted by the Attorney General to mandate that the notice list the particular items to be discussed rather than general topics. And so um, we mentioned here at one point a, a, a Carver opinion of the Attorney General, I think it was in a Carver one, that so it used to be that a lot of, for instance, I'm looking at the Board of Selectmen, towards the end of the year, you might have licensed renewals. And for most boards, that was sufficient to list licensed renewals. Well, uh, how many licensed renewals do you have? You must have dozens. Uh, eight, zero? Eight, 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 Eighty-three. So, and sometimes it'd be broken down to the, you know, common vitular, alcohol, whatever. Now, what the Attorney General said in this ruling, it's now two or three years old, is that you list actually every business involved. And uh, that came as a big surprise to everybody. Um, this came to a surprise to some people in the room. Um, so the, um, that's what I'm talking about, about the Attorney General's opinions really refining, if that's the right word, or getting more detailed about all of this. Um, and the so the Attorney General has found that notices include sufficient specificity when a reasonable member of the public can read the topic and understand the anticipated nature of the discussion, but they've gone much deeper than that. Okay. Um, the, um, so here's some of the, the practical implications. Uh, the, so this now gets into issues uh, that may come up at a meeting. So if a matter does not appear in the meeting notice and the chair did not reasonably anticipate that the matter would be discussed at the meeting, the law does not prohibit consideration of the matter. So in the course of discussing whatever the topic might be, someone might bring up uh, a matter that's d directly relevant and time sensitive and worth discussion. So that can be discussed, but the Attorney General says if it's not something that's time sensitive, it should be put off to your next agenda item. So you can have a, your next meeting and put it on that agenda. So you can have a brief discussion of it, but then at some point you should say, well, all right, we're really getting into the nitty gritty here, and it's not something we need to resolve tonight, so let's put it on our next agenda. So it's a bit of a, a balancing, and that's the however, you know, you can put it off and put it off. Uh, then the next bullet, if a matter is brought to the attention of the chair, so the meeting notice gets posted Thursday, and midday Friday, something that's timely, significant, is brought to the chair's attention, you can uh, amend, and that's what was referred to a few slides ago, you can amend your notice and date it, Friday, whatever the date might be, at 1.30, and post, have that new notice posted, and as well as the date of the original posting. So you've given, there's a good faith effort there to give as much notice as possible. If it happens to come up midday Monday, it's too late to uh, amend. I mean, it may not be too late. You could actually call in and have it amended. But again, if it legitimately was not something that the chair could have anticipated. And often we get these questions, well, there was this lawsuit that was out there, and the lawsuit's been out for months, and we just realized we really need to talk about this or that. And 
you know, I'll usually push back pretty hard and say, well, sounds to me like something that could really wait till the next agenda. Well, yeah, but so-and-so's going to be on vacation. Well, that, that wouldn't really be grounds if you can put it off. That's not something that just came to your attention. Yes, can, I, can I just ask you a question uh, about that? Some of the boards that, um, that do meet only meet periodically throughout the year. Yeah. So they might only meet four times a year. So if they have one meeting now, it's going to be three months down the line before they have another one. So is that somewhere where it would be time sensitive if it was important to, to make that amendment before the meeting? Yes. Now, again, if it's the statute says anything that the chair reasonably should have anticipated. So you have kind of a fine line there. What, what the law is forcing the chairs to do and the people working with the chair is to be really comprehensive in putting together the agenda. So if it's a matter of saying, oh, I forgot to put that on, the answer is probably going to be you're going to have to wait three months. But, you know, so, I, I so think all of the factors would be taken into consideration. Would, would this be something that you would put on the agenda as a running item? That yeah. If you, if you uh, discussed some particular matter and now you don't know when it's going to come up again uh, for another meeting because there's, there's other meetings that have taken place to resolve that issue. Uh, so it may, it may came, might come up before yeah. that other meeting. So is that why they run sometimes they'll keep stuff on the agenda? I, it, I mean, it, it may be, and if it got resolved, then when you put the agenda, when, when finally three and a half months later you put the next agenda, together you want to look at it and say, oh, we can scratch, you can right. have it on there as kind of a mental checklist, so we can take that one off. Okay. There are some boards of selectmen that have, every time they meet, whether it's once a week or twice a month or whatever, have executive session at the bottom of their agenda. And that's a really bad practice. We recently got a, uh, a, a public records request for the minutes of all of the executive sessions for a board of selectmen that meets twice a month. So in other words, it was 24 meetings. And on 24 of those agendas, it said executive session. And the requester got back uh, some minutes, and then some was told the minutes weren't available yet. But he got reports on nine out of 24 meetings. And he wrote back and he said, what happened to the other 13? And uh, um, the other 15. <laughs> Somebody was doing that. Um, and uh, they said, oh, well, actually, we didn't hold an executive session. So you could put it on there if, I mean, you don't have executive sessions with that kind of regularity. But anyway, it's something you don't want to have on as a routine item. So Bill, that's sort of the, the danger. Okay. Of that. Thank you. Um, okay. Meeting minutes. Uh, I know this question's come up in, in some contexts in the past. So they must include a summary of the discussions of each topic. Um, while a transcript is not required, clearly not required. Minutes must be sufficiently detailed to allow a person who was not there to determine the essence of the discussion and what documents were used. So there's, again, that's a more complete description of what minutes now need to be than it used to be. So it certainly doesn't have to be uh, a transcript by any stretch, but it's not enough to say that the board discussed the uh, you know, whatever the topic was, and they just leave it at that. If there was a 20-minute discussion, there really should be a few sentences. But again, you know, nobody is looking for each set of minutes to look like a book. Okay. Oh, and then the timeliness of meeting minutes. I mean, there's some boards that like review, you know, review their minutes once a quarter or so, and the the attorney general is clamping down on this when somebody complains and say, "Gee, I wrote the board." let's say this past week, you know, first week in July, looking for minutes in March, and they told me that they're not ready yet. So the Attorney General says that a one-month delay, a one-month time period turnaround is reasonable, two months is not. So that kind of gives you a guideline on that. Um, what, and if he, what if we have minutes, but they are approved because we don't have the same people at later meetings? Well, it's not essential that you have everybody there. I mean, it's kind of a, a courtesy, but you know, people who missed, who are at a meeting and are going to miss the next one, should 
send in any comments to whoever the recording secretary is or mark up a set and drop them off at town hall. But, I mean, it's not essential that everybody be there. You want a majority of the members who were at the last meeting to be able to approve those minutes. Yeah, we've had times where we just, you, you know, you might have a, a quorum that's met with four people and one of the four doesn't come for a couple months. Yeah, yeah. And then you never have a quorum of people who attended that meeting. But one what, what well, of the things is you, you, you do not have to attend the meeting to approve minutes. That's, you don't have to, you don't have to have the same, the same four people. Well, because there are times when you, you may never get that fourth, fourth person back. Right, but you, there's, so there's a person who hasn't attended, how would you know that those would be active? What was actually said at that minute? Well, the three people who were in attendance say that they are an accurate representation so you of what happened. Right, right. No, right. yeah. Well, in, in the, in, in the, other, the other way to approach it also, the other way is you can electronically uh, through email, distribute the minutes to all the members. Like uh, these packets that we get every week, we get these electronically every every week. So uh, I so we can review them. So you could also distribute the minutes to someone that's uh, out of town for an extended period of time, and he in turn could contact um, contact the chairperson with, with notes. So it's only one on one. It's not a conflict of interest or the meeting law violation. So they also have the right to come back. Yeah, they can do that. But I, um, well, let me make two points. I agree with what Dan's saying, but in addition, um, if a request is made and the draft minutes are available, they do have to be turned over. You can stamp them draft. Right. Right. Um, That's what I would but, expect to do. Yeah, but I, I don't think you want to go three months. I mean, I think after a couple of months, I would take Dan's suggestion and and you know whoever that person is say at our next meeting we're going to vote on the minutes of you know the following meetings and if you have any comments please send them into the uh, planning board office okay so these are just the resources on that if you want to learn more next slide so the conflict of interest law um just two points and I'm, i mean uh, most of you anyway have been on your boards for a while so you are a municipal employee, even if you're not a full-time paid municipal employee. I think you know that. Um, the Anyone performing services for the city or town or holding a municipal position, whether paid or unpaid and so forth, is a municipal employee under the conflict of interest law. The main point I always like to make, particularly for land use boards, is on the next slide. Um, so, well, of course, you know the main the whole point of the conflict of interest law, of course, is to avoid financial conflicts of financial interest. So municipal employees prohibited from participating in a particular matter in which the employee, the employee's immediate family, business, or employer has a financial interest. Now the, the next one is the, the, the critical one, is that municipal employee is presumed to have a financial interest in a property that directly abuts their own or that of their immediate family members. It could be your child, could be your parents. Um, in addition to direct abutters, this presumption applies if the employee has a property that qualifies under properties and in interest under the Zoning Act. So that's the property immediately abutting yours or an abutter to an abutter within 300 feet of your property. And by the way, that's the property, your house, but if you happen to own other properties in town, whether they're it's vacant land, farmland, rental properties, business property, any of those properties that you own, have a partial interest in, your sister, mother, whatever, has an interest in, we encourage you to read these next few pages and slides um, because this is important, and I'll just leave you with this last note on this um, on, on public records, and that is that the timelines are similar, they've changed a little bit, but the key is this, that there's 10 days to respond. The initial response, like before, can be to say, uh, we've got the records, we have to go through them, it's gonna take another, now it used to be that you could take forever, now you can't, and the, the timelines are in there. Um, and you give them a specific date by when they'll be ready. If you don't provide that response, and if you don't then respond by the other deadlines, you cannot collect the fees that you can charge which have been reduced to five cents a page from 20, excuse me, but you can still collect for the time, again, this is capped as well, but 
for the time of the individuals involved. Now, for extensive requests, that's big box. And if you haven't responded in timely fashion, you can't collect those fees. Um, and that's important. And the final thing is that if there is an appeal taken, and there's, there's some slides in there on appeals, and ultimately uh, the appeal is found worthy, uh, the town's going to have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. So that's a significant incentive to respond timely. May I yes. ask a question? I'm sorry. Of course. How long may a request stay open? The town responds within the 10 days, perhaps quotes the job at five cents a page and a couple of hours yeah. before, and there's no response. There's How no long? money back, you're Correct. saying. Yeah. Correct. How I, long is that an active, open ending? You know, that's a good question. Maybe I don't think we have an answer to that yet, because that question's come up. But Let's look into it because um, we've got a few orphans. All right, thank you. Yeah, and we'll um, Nicole will remind me to get back to you on that because that question came up several times. When we did the, the road show in the fall, and there was no answer then. But I, I don't know if there is one now. Um, all right, so the last set of slides we'll go through has to do with comprehensive permits, and this is a lead in to how the boards talk together. Um, and you may have heard that there's a comprehensive permit supposedly on its way, right? Everybody's aware of that. Um, Water Street. Water Street, yeah. yeah. So, and the latest is it's still, well, I guess they're at the Conservation Commission? Tonight. Tonight. Okay, so, but, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the procedure here, but there is important coordination here between boards so, Christine, are you brand new on the zoning board? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this will be a nice experience. Um, and actually, I mean, the, the zoning board over the years has handled many uh, comprehensive permits. We had one in the last 10 years that we had. Bunches, yeah. One of them, uh, 14, uh, 14 or 15 previous to that. Yeah, but it really has slow down in Pembroke, not statewide. Statewide, it's just it's really been a flood. Um, I think yes. subdivisions in general have slowed down in Pembroke because we just don't have as much land. Yeah. Yeah, that all happened, I guess, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so, so conference of permits, of course, you got the citation up there. People also refer to them as, uh, refer to as Chapter 40B. So the second bullet, it subsumes and overrides other local permits, bylaws, regulations, and approvals. So that's really the key. That's the comprehensiveness of it, the, the one-stop shopping. That was the whole idea. This law got written in the early 70s, and the idea was let's focus all of these permits into one board, and that's the zoning board, and whether it's uh, subdivision approval that's handled by the planning board, whether it's a local wetlands bylaw, whether it's the town's Board of Health regulations for Title V, whatever the local permit might be, whether it's a uh, historic district, it, that, all of those regulatory structures are handled through the zoning board that's going to issue one comprehensive permit. So uh, we recommend um, before the application that the zoning boards that says ZBA regulations, it, it should really be specific and say the comprehensive permit regulations. And do we know when they were last updated? What? Your comprehensive permit regulations. I don't think there have been any. You don't think there are any? No. Nope. Wow. We should get on that. Yeah. She's right. Yeah. Well, because that's going to describe the fees you can charge. Yeah, so that's a high priority item. Yeah, it's it drastically changed from the early ones to, the, to what's in effect today. Yeah. Because that the last one of the uh, of Bridge Street is entirely different from all the all the ones we had previously. Okay. So we well, we do have a set of recommended regulations in the can. So why don't we try to that would be nice. get those out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that was time well spent right there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and a filing fee. Now, this is a very interesting case. You, uh, well, it'll, it'll come up later, but I'll mention it now. 
So the town of Hanover was involved in a case just a little bit more than a year ago where an applicant, so the filing fees can be pretty high because it is an extensive operation. You're going to hire consultants and so forth. And um, although the consultants are handled separately, as I'm sure you remember, but the uh, in this particular case the, with this Hanover application, the uh, fee was on the order, I'm going to say, of around $30,000. And the applicant said, that's ridiculous. I'm not filing anything. And the, um, the, uh, the, the zoning board, sorry, the zoning board said, well, all right, we're going to get started. But uh, and they denied it because the applicant on the grounds that what you don't want to do is stand still because it'll be constructively granted. So the zoning board denied it because the fee wasn't paid. And it went to the Housing Appeals Committee, which is where all of these appeals have to go. The Housing Appeals Committee rules against local zoning boards, I'm going to randomly say 95% of the time, and that's going to be pretty accurate. In this case, they, they ruled in favor of the zoning board. They said, the zoning board's absolutely right. Um, you should have uh, paid the full fee, and they were right to deny you. So they went back, and they paid the full fee under protest that they would challenge it in court. Meanwhile, in that period of time, another project had come through in Hanover so that the town had achieved one of the safe harbors, so they were within their rights to deny the project. So then they uh, served them right. And so then they went to court and went all the way up, I can't remember if it was the appeals court or the Supreme Judicial Court, and the appellate court said that uh, Hanover was correct in having denied your application in the first place and they were within their rights to deny you the second time because the safe harbor was met because your application wasn't complete the first time. So um, the fees will be in the regulations as well. So they've got to pay the filing fee. So I'm just quickly going to mention the safe harbors when this application comes in. We can look at it more closely. But So the safe harbor is just uh, jargon, if you will saying that a town does not have to grant a 40B application if they qualify for one of the safe harbors. So the classic one is that 10% uh, of the to town's housing stock, the SHI is the um, subsidized housing inventory. And where are you now? You're about nine something? 965. 965. So um, you're really close. 1.5 of land area, 1.5% of the town's Total land area is occupied by affordable housing. A lot of towns are trying to qualify under that. It's a really tough standard to meet. Uh, Joel? Yes? Who is the arbiter of the 1.5 percent? Because we, uh, <coughs> we are studying that. Closely. Yeah. We are going through that with several towns right now. So it's DHCD, Department of Housing and Community Development, and they take an engineer's look at it. I mean, it's a calculation. It's a land calculation. But that's, that's who determines it. Because they're, they're the keepers, by the way, of the subsidized housing inventory as well. Pretty much this whole process is overseen by DHCD. Right. And when, when I ask that, it's because our chief assessor is uh, doing the, performing the calculations on, on yeah. our end. Okay. And uh, when she hands it over to DHCD, uh, how would they refute what she presents them? Well, let me just say, before you make hand it over, talk to Amy Quessel in our office has been starting to work on this in the town. And she's handled a lot of 40Bs, so she'll want to advise you on that. But one of our towns ran the numbers by us, and, and Amy said, well, we'll go ahead and submit it, but it's not going to get approved, and it didn't. But sometimes there are little tweaks. Anyway, so do work with us when the yeah, assessor. Yeah, you've made corrections before. Yeah. Where, where they've been wrong, that, as long as we gave them the figures, on what they were and what, where the error was made, it's, it's been changed. Yeah. You're talking about the subsidized housing yeah. inventory. Yes, yeah. yes. All right. Lou, or, yeah. Yeah, I had a question on those four items you have up there. Yes. Are they all equal weight? Yes. Any one of these is a safe harbor, and there are going to be a couple more on the next slide. So if you can satisfy any one of these, then for in summertime limited, um, but Yes, they're of equal weight in that sense. So the next one, um, yeah, well, that's where you saw them. And then here are more that, again, I'm, the point here is not to dwell on these, but just to give you a sense of it because it's coming down the pike. Next one. Um, 
Now, I just wanted to mention this because this will be one of the first formal notices you get is this project eligibility letter. So it's issued and it's going to be sent to the Board of Selectmen. And it's issued by the subsidizing agency, which sometimes is DHCD itself. I think most commonly Mass Housing Mass Partnership. Housing. Yes? Some of us are sort of wondering, this is not typically something the planning board gets involved in. Right. And so I'm just wondering if we could fast forward we're almost to done. some of the things we need to yeah, do. We're almost and then done. We can have a more comprehensive discussion. Right. We're yeah. almost done. And, and I think it is going to be useful for you to know this because if I remember, some members of this planning board were screaming in this room some number of years ago over a 40B. And I think it's really important that the planning board understands it's what now it's not five years ago so yeah no i understand no it's just <laughs> there's some of the same members um but in any event i take your point and um the project eligibility letter i was saying there are three funding agencies when it comes in you'll want to pay attention to it next slide so the application next slide um so the public hearing process is noticed the same way as it is for zoning you want to avoid constructive approval and the next slide is the one that we want to talk about because this is a citation right out of the statute um, so the Board of Appeals when it receives the application shall forthwith notify each such local board and the local boards I mentioned earlier as applicable applicable of the filing of the 40b application by sending a copy thereof to such local boards for their recommendations and shall within 30 days of receipt of the application hold a public hearing on the same. So what I, we highlighted there the word recommendations. So the planning board is going to get notice of this from the Zoning Board of Appeals. You will want to have a public hearing. Of course you've got to do, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to be a public hearing, a public meeting to discuss the application. So you will have wanted the, the precursor stuff I was talking about, you will want to be paying attention to that because you're going to get notice of it. You're going to have 30 days to schedule your meeting and then and you may want to meet and discuss it a couple of times. And then we're going to talk about the discussion you're going to have with the Zoning Board of Appeals. So what basis does, what jurisdictional basis or what basis does the planning board have to recommend or not recommend a 40B. I mean, typically, we make the point for everyone to consider that if it's not following the subdivision rules, it's unlikely that we'll approve it as a public way or that we would suggest approval as a public way. But beyond that, um, I think our feeling is that our hands are pretty tied in terms of what we can say or you know what impact our recommendation would have on the process. Well. So the first, you start out by asking what jurisdiction you have. So this is what gives you jurisdiction to make a recommendation. You have no jurisdiction over the permit. Right. None. No, that's, that's right. So your recommendation is quite important because, I mean, I've seen planning boards come in with, whether it's two or 12 well-written recommendations, they often end up as conditions of the permit. So recommending denial, and, and oftentimes, the planning board's recommendation is to deny and then list the reasons for denial. Um, frequently that's not a fruitful approach because those denials are overturned 90 some percent of the time. So it's really up to the planning board to use this 30 day window to make these kinds of decisions. You know, do we, you can do both, you know, recommend grounds for disapproval and also recommend conditions of approval. There's no reason why you can't do both in you know, recognizing that the zoning board may have no grounds to deny. But, but I mean, embedded in your question was the knowledge that ultimately you don't have the ability to say no. And, and that's understood, but you know, just explain the extent to which um, you can have some influence. And then, so here we get into the, the dialogue. Um, then you go to the the, the zoning board public hearing and the planning board can show up on mass like this and say you know we 
would like to have 20 minutes for our board, our planning board, to sit down with you, the zoning board, and share with you our concerns and then give you our recommendations or conditions or whatever it's going to end up being. And at that point, you're saying we can do that under the guise of we can, as long as we're talking in an open forum, would we notice that as a, as a joint meeting? That one you definitely should, yes. Because we would be speaking as, as a, a board. board. Yeah, definitely. So, quick yeah. question. <clears throat> on, the, on the Quad EB, does the planning board the recommendation um, as far as improvements to the way in which access is granted to the Quad EB? Uh, is there anything that in the norm that you can get improvements in the roadway system? You mean the public way? Correct. Yes. Y yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends on the scale of the project. So if it's eight units, obviously, you, right. But if it's um, a Pembroke Wood scale thing, yeah. You could, you could get improvements to the roadway system. Some. I mean, again, it's a matter of, of scale right. um, as to, you know, what... I mean, the number of units, and, and the number of units, of course, ties into the amount of traffic it's going to generate, which would then be the nexus to reasonably require an intersection improvement, let's say, or a widening of a, a left-hand turning so, lane. So in our, in our um, not review, but in our discussion, that was something that we would probably put in there yes. as, a, as a proper response. Yeah, and, and that would be the kind of thing I would think that a zoning board would look to the planning board for guidance on. Exactly the kind of thing. Yeah. Can they require a, tra a traffic study? Sure. That's a common, commonly required. Yeah. No, on the ones that we did tonight, the denials that stood up were on, based on the traffic. Yeah. That's the strongest thing. We did, we we did tonight. I think they were, I know there were two. There were two on Washington Street. We denied because of traffic. Yeah, 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 because of traffic. That if you throw something else in there that's smaller than the, even those units, you're, you're becoming into a uh, jam. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, scale's an issue. If it's six or eight units, the traffic study, you could still ask for a traffic study if it's a tough intersection or a heavily traveled road, but it's going to be a smaller scale study. But yeah, it's a commonly requested um, uh, study. Brian, did you have your hand up? No, I was just commenting. Oh. I, was, I was trying to specify, try to recall two 40 Ds in town being denied. Oh, well, there were, right on Washington Street. One, one way down on Washington Street, one uh, down by Taylor. Did you go back one in before the year 2000? Possibly. I've been involved with the planning board yeah, 17 probably. years. Possibly. I can't recall any denial. But, but All right. Definitely. So the, and the next key thing here that's underlined is so this is the Board of Appeals, shall have the same power to issue permits or approvals as any local board or official. And I know I mentioned that before, but it's there it is right in black and white. So the, that's the comprehensive nature of the permit. Um, so in terms of uh, how the interaction goes, uh, I do think that <clears throat> it would be useful, I mean, maybe not for seven planning board members to show up. It's up to the planning board. But some delegation of the planning board to show up at a zoning board hearing and have a, a conversation with the zoning board uh, when, uh, when the time comes. I mean, obviously, there's already uh, significant interest on in this coming 40B, so there'll be a number of people commenting. But that's certainly one in terms of interactions between the boards, which is fundamentally why, why I'm here tonight. Um, that's an important interaction and one that's coming down the pike before too long, as best we know. And Joel, yes. In the, there's even room there for the, the official board action. So the planning board is very important for their opinion and uh, their recommendations in any 40B, but also if, if, the, if the board uh, voted to uh, 
denied a project or recommended that a project be denied. Uh, attending the, the hearing is also a way for any descending dissenting members to go and, and speak speak the other side if you wanted to. If you have the forum for it and you have the right to do it as a planning board member. Yeah. Okay, then shifting gears, I just have a, uh, well, that, this is more, um, so, uh, no, that was coordination. So these were the more general topics, and maybe, Becky, what you had in mind at the outset. But there are a couple of places where the, um, the permitting that falls within the jurisdiction and falls within the Zoning Board of Appeals kind of come together on a certain project. So in center protection, of course, we saw in the last year a project requiring a variance from the Zoning Board, a special permit from the Planning Board, and then you, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had in the past instances where uh, you have site plan approval, which is handled by the uh, planning board, and there may be a variance or some other involvement from the zoning board of appeals. And, and I guess the, the question for discussion, uh, I don't know, Christine, if you want to feel you can uh, speak for the zoning board, but this would be the kind of thing you'd want to have a, a dialogue between the two boards about. Well, and then there's a third one, which is in the residential commercial district, there's kind of a hybrid provision where the um, zoning board issues the special permit as it usually does, but there's additional um, requirements in that particular district for mixed-use projects uh -huh. that there be that it sort of be after the planning board. Are you referring back to the site plan approval being from the planning board, but special permit approval being from the CBA? Well, that's typical. But in, in the residential commercial district for multi-unit dwellings, there's some specific language in here saying that provided that the planning board, after notice in a public hearing, shall find a rule that such structures shall not be injurious, noxious, offensive, or detrimental to the neighborhood and subject to the dimensional requirements. So it's, it requires the planning board to use some of the same criteria that you typically see in a special permit or a variance type setting. Um, so it's almost like we're both ruling on whether it's um, not noxious or injurious or whatever. So that's also a kind of weird work of our mm -hmm. particular bylaw mm -hmm. in the residential commercial district um, that has caused a little bit of pause of who goes first, is it ever appropriate for the two boards to meet together when they have always, separate? Always appropriate. Even when yeah. we have separate, so there's been a theory that if we have, have to make separate rulings that we actually should not meet about the same project in a joint meeting. There's actually somewhere in the statute, and it got added because that view was out there, and we'll have to find it and send an email out. I don't remember what it is, but that talks about boards having joint hearings. Um, and we can have a joint actual public hearing. Yeah. And in a joint public hearing, we could have the variance special permit, all of these in the same hearing? You can, because it's the same project, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're looking at the same facts, so the... The zoning board may have particular questions because of some of the findings they have to make, and the planning board may have particular questions, but by and large, you're going to have the same questions. And um, it always makes sense to do it that way, and yet so few boards do it. But couldn't an applicant appeal our decision to the CPA? Uh, very few. The, um, the site, site plan. Could, right? They can appeal a site plan decision is the only one. So could we have a site plan hearing in conjunction with their variance hearing if they're the appeal body for a site plan review? Well, yes, because, so, I mean, for, uh, eventually the boards are going to go their separate ways unless you want to sit in the, unless the planning board wants to sit in the room while the zoning board has their discussion and votes on their on their permit. I mean, typically what happens is you have a joint public hearing and then you schedule for another night the planning board meets and has its discussion uh, and votes on its piece of the project and the zoning board does it. I mean, you could sit in the same room, but typically, you know, the, 
the, the zoning board is sitting there quietly while you all talk, and then you have to sit and listen to them talk. So usually you, you separate for that. You're saying yes, but no. No, you, you, you can. I mean, I suppose I am. I mean, you can, but no, you probably don't want to. Okay. As a practical matter, the zoning board deliber deliberations should take several months. Are we there to attend every meeting to make sure that at the end of the day what we've brought up should be recognized somewhere into that decision? Or do we just hit one meeting, two months goes by, and voila, how comes the approval anyway? Well, so you, you'll want to, so let's say, so the idea is you have a joint public hearing, and that might take whatever, an hour, two hours, whatever it might be, or 45 minutes, and then the boards deliberate as their own schedules allow. So the planning board, well, you may want to communicate. I, I mean, among other things, you want to be sure you're sending each other notice about, oh, hey, we're taking up, you know, 220 Main Street next week at our next meeting, which is two weeks from now or whatever, so that if you want to keep tabs on how, and maybe the board, each board wants to sit in on the other's discussion or not, but I mean, obviously, you know, the planning board can't control the zoning board schedule and vice versa, but I mean, you would assume that each board is going to act as expeditiously as their schedule is going to allow. <coughs> Brian, one of the things having a public meeting together, a public hearing together, I should say, we could say jointly that we would postpone the, or continue the public hearing at a date certain that we will all agree, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I would imagine so. I've never seen a level of communication between the two boards, whether it's granting or variances or special permit, that would indicate that there's a willingness to have us in the room at the same time and expressing the same projects as if we may have an ultimate ability to shift their vote in some way. Joel, one quick point though. You mentioned about site plan. My understanding about site plan after the planning board took that, uh, that uh, administrative matter out of the hands of the zoning board about 10 years ago. Now. I remember that town meeting. Okay. And we even heard it once before was that a site plan really is not an appealable mention of, of, of action to the, uh, to the ZDA. In fact, the only thing that could be appealed after a site plan approved by the planning board and then variance is granted by the ZBA is once the administrator of the building department or the building inspector issued a building permit. That's correct. Now an applicant can come in and challenge what the board uh, mm -hmm. approved on the site plan, but only upon the issuance of the building permit itself. Right. It's, I was giving a shorthand answer, but ultimately, so that's right. I mean, just uh, there's a lot of case law on this. So the the immediate decision on site plan review is not appealable. It goes to the building inspector. When the building inspector issues the building permit based on the site plan approval, that decision of the building inspector is appealable to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the appeal is, at that point, just the appeal of the special permit. They just need to go through the intermediate step of the issuance of the building permit. Right. So but you Yes. But to your earlier point, though, Brian, I mean, you're right. Uh, I don't know if you're right, but I mean, you're, I'm going to assume you're right. You're saying that there hasn't been the communication, but I think the point of this is to create the communication uh, between the boards, right? I mean, that's... Now would be the time to do it, because the zoning board's a brand new board. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the question that comes up a lot for us, too, is, you know, we'll sometimes look at a site plan and say, well, you have to go to CBA for a variance on a... Um, you know, frontage. a setback or something, frontage. Um, frontage. frontage, something like that. Um, but I think that sometimes there's a little bit of <coughs> ambiguity as to what really is the standard for variance. You know, how commonly should those be seen? And how much are we giving or not giving them? Because, I mean, we just basically took mixed use off of the Center Protection District for anything filed after the end of this year, right? at town meeting that was voted as a bylaw change to take mixed use off the center protection district um, so that there's some ability to sort of go back and look at the center protection district and say what do we as a town really want there and what is what is the goal there um, but there that there were some issues about what is 
you know, if, if something requires a 50% threshold and a variance is given for a 90% threshold, you know, at what point is a variance just saying, well, we're going to look at everything sort of sui generis as opposed to in the context of the bylaws? And how do right. we have those discussions without it becoming, you know, a court matter? Right. Because I think we so, want to be suing each other. The, right, and, and believe me, we handle a lot of those. Um, uh, so the legal standards for the granting of a variance are almost impossible to meet, literally. Very, very difficult to meet. There are something like two or three reported cases of the grant of a variance uh, being upheld on the merits. You know, usually what happens is the courts throw them out on the grounds of standing. but. Um, so it's rare that a variance is legal in the sense of um, meeting the standards. On the other hand, once it's granted and the 20-day appeal period has run, it's legal. So the question is, where's the fine line? I mean, oftentimes uh, it's in the community's best interest, if you will, that a certain project go forward because it's a good project, however you may want it you know, for the time, the location, and, and whatever. Um, and it seems to make sense to grant the setback variance or the frontage variance, whatever it might be. And, I, I mean, honestly, there, there are no answers, Becky, to your question. I mean, where I live in Cambridge, where everything's densely built up, it's almost impossible for anybody to do anything to their house without a variance. I mean, it just, and so, you know, there'd be no, there'd be very little by way of renovation, if you will. Uh, without variances. So I think that in, in other communities, they never grant variances. Uh, there's several communities I work in where they just don't grant variances, period. You know, don't even bother applying. Um, so um, the, I mean, that's the message. Obviously, everybody has the right to apply. So the answers to your questions are going to come in the dialogue with the zoning board. So you may want to look at the zoning board's agendas and see if a variance application is before the zoning board, and have it on your agenda. In fact, if you're going to discuss it, it should be on your agenda, going back 10 slides or so. And, um, and you'll have a discussion and say, well, you know, we'll let the zoning board handle this one. Um, but you're looking to say, well, this is, this is just too much, in which case the board, the planning board, might want to take a formal vote and send one of the members to the next zoning board meeting and say, you know, we gave this serious consideration and we think this is asking too much we think it's out of scale with you know whatever you know whatever your rationale may be and present a case for why the zoning board should deny it and i think if and that's one way obviously respectfully so you know we understand it's your you the zoning board it's your decision but you know we looked at it and we think it violates the following standards in the town and Mm -hmm. adjustments yeah, yeah. In those cases, we could have one public hearing mm -hmm. and just notice it together if we, if we got coordinated well enough. Yes, yeah, that's a good example. And by the way, you know, I was going to say the, the issue of chicken and egg, of variance and site plan review, every town struggles with that because there is no, no order really. Um, so what are I, I think, <laughs> what was the answer? I said the same thing we do. Go back and forth. Well, Send people back and forth. well, there's that. But then also, it's the applicant's choice, right? I mean, if the applicant files a variance application to the zoning board, they've got 100 days, period. Mm -hmm. And the applicant might choose to get the variance, let the 20-day appeal period run, and then show up at the planning board. And you have no control over that. And we've always said, since it got divided, Is if you guys grant a variance 
and then we don't like the way the site's laid out for well, like a safety reason, you then they have to go back you again. Get, you get copies of everything when we're hearing it. You could ask for and make your comments then too. Well, but we're not yet all meeting as a board to have the site, the review of the site. Well, you, you have more meetings than we do. Uh, you meet every, every couple of I know, weeks. You, you seem to meet every week you these could, days. Uh, you, could review, you could review things if there was something of interest to any one of your members. You could review it and write it to the Board of Health, to the Zoning Board, or anything else. But, things coming up. but I think that sort of, um, that's an interesting comment. I, I wish we were sitting in a way that we could talk to each other a little more easily. I don't know if you want to move on so that we're not, we're not putting our back to Joel or putting our back to you. Um, it's not a great way to have a conversation. But one of the things that I think that indicates to me, though, is maybe we don't spend enough time talking about what we do. So if we're going to do a site plan review, chances are we have an engineer involved. So if they haven't yet made application to us for a site plan review, then we don't yet have an engineering account to pay for engineers. For anything that requires site plan review, they have to be an engineer for our to come, for, to come to us. No, 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 but we don't review the engineer drawings only on our own. We hire outside engineers. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you couldn't give it, you can give it to Merrill Mar Mar uh, 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 when you're getting it. Not if they haven't given us money for an engineering account. We don't have any money budgeted to pay for engineering. We have no budget for engineering. So what ends up happening is that the the applicant makes an application and typically, let's say they have to put some money into an engineering account, $2,500 or $5,000 as a sort of just basic um, engineering account for a site for review. So without that money, without that application before us, we don't have, we can't send it to Merrill. But the same you. joke is if you work the other way around, if you did site planning first, and then you came to us and we didn't like what the variances were to be, then all the time wasted on the site plan and the money would be gone down the drain. Right, which is why I was asking about having some of these discussions on a, on a, on a difficult project, particularly. Well, we don't take the length of time. No, let me say it earlier. We don't take the length of time. I guess you start to we got about three minutes, three minutes left. We're still in our public hearing, our, our public meeting, so we don't have to meet that deadline. Yeah, that can just go later. Yeah. Do we have a continuation of public hearing? Yeah. Yes. Brian? I just want to go back to the point you were raising about the uh, the low probability of a variance standing up in the courtroom. We have a definition in our zoning bylaws currently, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. It basically gives about two reasons, and they're usually around financial hardship uh, to the applicant by uh, denial. Well, your language is right out of the state law. The Correct. State, yeah. okay. That's what I'm trying to confirm. What are the basic, how can you actually issue a variance it has a very high successful probability rate if it doesn't meet financial hardship in some way. Or there are no conditions to the soil or conditions of the land and the topography itself. How does the zoning board get away with issuing five or six or seven or two or five on any project? Well, as I said, zoning boards do because they, they do it as but a, they as do a it because practical. Zoning boards won't appeal those obvious violations of granting a variance, well, of which we recently came upon within the past uh, approval at a site that had been previously appealed by the planning board two years ago now, came back up, and was granted the variance, five of them, I believe, to allow that. Way beyond frontage, went into areas of housing and density and no commercial application to the site, and in the minutes of that proceeding, or comments from uh, chairman and board members alike saying, uh, we really aren't, what do we even focus on that for? Why would a zoning board concern itself with housing density, for instance, when there is no hardship here presented in the first instance? There is nothing attributable to the lot itself that would grant the variance. But they merrily go down the path of usurping a zoning bylaw, as if it had nothing to do with that. In a way. Now the rest of it goes on that. And Michelle pointed out something. Well, 
we not, who's going to come in and pay $20,000 up front for engineering when if you don't get that variance, you're never even going to get to see the planet. Right. That's step one that most developers do. It's not, oh yeah, we'll go over to you and start doing all the engineering costs and all the things relative to that. <laughs> when in fact there is no engineering requirement of documents to a zoning board. Right. They're there for one legal purpose, determining the legality of that variance versus the standard presented in the zoning bylaw. So, Brian, let me, let me be devil's advocate here as a member of your own board, um, and that is that, you know, maybe part of what we can add to this process is to split up a little bit and go to some more of the zoning board meetings and talk about any concerns we have about variances in specific projects that are going to come back to us. We won't have the benefit of engineering review, but we may have the benefit of being able to say, but we have concerns that there's going to be an overdevelopment there that may impact traffic, or that may impact safety, or that may impact other things that will come back to us. Becky, on that one, we better mention it before we grant or don't grant right. something, and then uh, wait until after and say, hey, though, no, and, and granting that. Well, that's what I was saying. If we, if we could split up and on some of the projects where the variance is a little bit more touchy from our point of view, that we try to come to the ZBA meeting without the benefit well, that's of the jury. That's wonderful. That's jurisdictional. That's wonderful. Uh, that's a come by the out moment or whatever, you know, we get together. But it, there's got to be a cornerstone. It's not and Something we can have a yeah. lot of discussion. And we like that one, but we don't like this one. Which already puts mm -hmm. us in positions at the board also that says, when he comes to us for that site plan approval eventually, now we're on record as to whether we liked it. Mm -hmm. It goes into a lot of other areas about things. And so, you know, you have, uh, again, a, uh, creating a condition of uh, potential conflicts of interest because we've already stated for, for instance, what a preposition was. Right. Well, that's just for the record, that, that that's not a conflict of interest. I mean, nobody has an interest in it. I mean, when, when it gets before you for site plan approval, you're looking at fairly specific, you're literally site-specific considerations, Correct. traffic, landscaping, that sort of thing. Degrees, so, modification. yeah. Strainage, so, management. yeah, so the fact that you do or don't like the project, you know, so maybe you've expressed... Like, oh, it looks like a decent project, but, you know, if it doesn't measure up in stormwater, forget it. And if the roadway alignment doesn't work according to you, what your engineer tells you, they got to fix it. I mean, so... That's what we do. It's, yeah, and exactly. That, and that's oh. what we had to do with the most recent project here, obviously, is take that decision that was just gross numbers of things, 28 housing units, whatever, all two bedrooms, uh, all the types of things that went into this decision, that... Really, I mean, uh, where do you where do you come up with this zoning board? Where do you where do you come up with this fantasy that not only are you the gateway to development in many cases to the various process, but you also become judge and jury about the type of development now that's going on there, which is way outside of your uh, jurisdiction. Well, I think it gets to them because the remember there's a developer in here. The developer is saying what's feasible or desirable for his project. Um, and, and so I don't think it's not the zoning board making this stuff up. It's a developer coming in and requesting a certain mix or whatever it might be. And um, I, do you guys have another 10 minutes to continue the conversation from the board of selectmen standpoint? Because what I'd like to do is we have a public hearing that's scheduled for 8.30. I'd like to just go on record and continue our public hearing and postpone it by 15 minutes? Is that okay with you? Yeah. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, we're going to take a quick break as a planning board to uh, open a public hearing for the proposed definitive subdivision number 1702 Macomber Lane, located at 476 Center Street, consisting of two buildable lots and two non buildable lots. Um, so, we're reopening this public hearing which is continued from June 26, 2017 at 7 o'clock. So we'll make the motion and postpone the meeting school. Okay, all in favor? All right. Okay, so we've con we've continued that hearing to um, 8.45. So my question is, is there, on, on more complicated projects, 
Is there anything that would prevent the town from having a rule that you have to apply for the variance and the site plan or the special permit at the same time? Does the developer have complete control over that? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I suppose what you could do is certainly set guidelines that this is the town's preferred order. Certainly no harm in that. Um, several, years, oops. several years ago, the, when that site plan change occurred, we met with the uh, zoning board at that time. Uh, in fact, I believe it was the town council there. I don't think they knew what was going to but my mm -hmm. recollection is that there was uh, some one year attorneys from the law firm there. Uh, what came out of that discussion? basically something that I was trying to relate to before, which is the variance process is nowhere near as costly as the site plan process. Right. They're just not equal. Yeah. Outside of attorney's cost, when you want representation before a zoning board, which is probably the legitimate cost, yeah. you come before us for a site plan, and we immediately say, based on the size and scale of this project, you're going to have to lay out several thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. And our process has been no longer than the zoning board's process in most cases, um, as, as was witnessed with the center protection uh, situation we had. Um, so it's unlikely, from a development point of view, that somebody can't but must have a variance because they don't need something simple up front, which we can deny them on right away because we uphold the zoning in town. Right? Right. Somebody we, comes we to us, we say, you, you we can't fly with this, yeah. or you got nothing. Yeah. So if you're in that position, would you rather pony up all the engineering fees and all the things that go with it, and the attorney and all the other representatives you need, at an unknown expense potentially, get approved by us, go to the ZBA for that variance, and they say simply, doesn't comply, you don't have a hardship, and you don't have any ir irregularities to the law. Well, that's why I was trying to find ways on some of these projects to make it somewhat more simultaneous. Why? Because... Who's going to go dual track? It's, it, you well, either get both well, or I've, you get nothing. Well, I've looked at a couple of the projects where the, um, the applicants had already hired engineers, done engineered plans. Michelle's saying that they won't consider a variance without engineered plans. In some cases, they've already... In, in one of the center protection cases that was very controversial. They had already hired an attorney, they had hired engineering, and they brought those people to the ZBA meeting. Too. I think one. On Center Street. Which one? On Center Street, the one we just approved. They well, went to they, CPA. They were asked by a member of the crowd for a traffic study to be completed, for instance, prior to the variance, and they wanted to have information about traffic impacts into their neighborhood. This was presented by persons who lived right in that immediate area. I believe the response was simply, that will get done when it gets to the planning board. That's right, it was. Agreed, okay, that's so what, that's to go to your does. specific point, right? You're saying, well, they required engineering. There was no site plan beyond perhaps. I didn't even see topographical lines of any uh, manner on their plans that were submitted to the CBA. They were as good as a landscaping company something like that, but not an engineer, uh, a fully licensed engineer would never stick behind something like that. So, no, they're not fully engineered plans. No, in that particular case, there was no traffic study. Did. We required a traffic study to be done, and we required a fully engineered plan, and we required another expensive little link in here, your landscaping plan. Okay? I mean, Landscaping costs the developer tens of thousands of dollars, or at the mercy of a board, can be certainly significantly reduced. So, so Joel, a lot you, of costs up front for the developer that just come to us. You've had us come to your office on a couple occasions to ask for advice on how to handle this. You know, we're having some sort of discussion here, a little free form, about how boards with different jurisdictions are trying to or not effectively 
able to handle this process. What do you find legally we might be able to do to to make it run a little more smoothly? I mean, is it is it just there's no way other than to tell the developers go here first or go here first? I mean, as as we're sort of trying to pull it back together, what is your what is your sense? Well, my sense is it's more organic than having someone tell you how you should do it. Um, because as I said, towns do it differently. There aren't that many models really. And I will say in a lot of towns, they do want site plan last. I mean, partly again, it is developer driven. But I, I think, I do think the key here might be more communication between the boards. I think that if the board gets a stronger sense uh, of the new zoning board in particular gets a stronger sense of what the planning board is looking for, and if the planning board is looking at the variance applications and looking at those projects that are looking particularly more significant than others and provides your, you know, has, as I said earlier, a discussion at your meeting and then sends a delegate or two to a zoning board meeting. I think that's sort of the way forward rather than, I don't think it's a one size fits all. So one of the things that has been brought up is that if we go to the meeting, the ZBA variance meeting, let's say, public hearing, and we express an opinion that we like or don't like a particular design. And then as we get into the site plan review and talk to our engineers and, and talk about it a little more in detail with the plans in front of us and the topography of the land and all of that laid out, we reach a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. Do we expose the town to any sort of risk that the developer will say that that was unfair, that we participated in that hearing? and gave them reason to continue to spend money that, that no, hamstring I, us and ultimately right. get in denial? I, I don't see risk there. I mean, you will be, if, if you proceed that way, you'll certainly be subject to that kind of argument from the developer. Uh, but there's no risk there. I mean, you can change your mind. But I would suggest, if you're going to the zoning board, that your comments of a design nature would be limited. I mean, the zoning board, I mean, you can say to the developer, just a heads up, you know, at this early stage, we haven't reviewed everything, but we don't like, we, at this point, we don't think we like where the driveway's located, or, you know, those kinds of macro scale comments, and focus more, I mean, there's no point, let me put it this way, there's no point going to the zoning board and making site plan type comments. You go to the zoning board to talk to them about whatever it is that's within the zoning board's jurisdiction. And if there is something about it that, I mean, when, when the planning board discussed it and you looked at it and you said, you know, what's this guy thinking, or this, you know, guy or woman thinking, um, by putting the building there, putting the driveway there, or leaving all the trees here and clearing that part of the site or whatever, on a macro scale, maybe make some comments. So, and by the way, when you come before us for site plan review, we envision having some major concerns with some of these site issues, namely A, B, C, and D. But... At the zoning board, you'd want to focus more on the zoning boards, the issue before the zoning board, and not use it as kind of a dry run for site plan. And that way, you won't run into the problem you envision. But in any event, if you couldn't help yourself and you got into some of those issues because you all agreed it was really grossly incorrect, sure, why not give the person a heads up on an issue where you're clearly not going to be changing your mind in two months. So I think you want to avoid getting into finer site plan review points at that earlier stage. Joel, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is, um, can you do something informally, um, an appearance by a developer in front of the planning board to say, you know, this is what I'm proposing and have some, you know, rough sketches and rough ideas of what it is? And as Brian said, you're not anyway. forking over $20,000. We can come up with it. Almost everything is, is a, an informal prior to a formal submission where we're allowed to handle uh, here. You know, somebody's coming in with a proposal, but not there yet. So we get that sort of thing. Yeah, because if there are variances needed. You well, know, we know then a if a variance is, and they'll often say, oh, you, you know you need that or you need this. If we see it on the initial... So is there anything so wrong with sending them to the... Question, the question is, once we do that, and it escalates beyond what they really needed to go for, 
and all of a sudden it's designing in the ZBA is where the issue lies. And the ZBA can't act on the informal. No, what I'm getting, what we're getting at is sometimes we have an informal. We know this is a frontage issue, that they have to get relief, send them to the ZBA, but from there, all of a sudden that project is in there. Because they, they went into a dimensional control issue and it came out with the uh, a density factor or something like right. that. Correct. Right. And, that, and, this with, and this is where the problem is. If, they, if the CBA was to limit their exposure to the site to, let's say, the variance that they really need to get a site plan through the, through the planning board, there wouldn't be an issue. Right. We review the project. And, you know, if somebody comes in again informally, but most developers of significant size or significant project I'm going to come in with an informal just to run it by us. Initially. Well, that seems to me to make the most sense because if you happen yeah. to disagree with him and he's got a dimensional control issue, he can Tell take me. it to the Zoning Board of Appeals and come back to you if, if in fact, it's granted, if it's lost. As long as it's limited, if it's lost, then well. they never have a chance. Right. You know? I mean, we are there as the initial way of reviewing the zoning bylaws and how they affect any developable site. We can't tell them, we'll help you along with that thing. We won't pay attention to that 150-foot frontage requirement with your plan. And right, you've got to send it to the variance first. It's 142 first. feet, get the 8 feet, or it, it's a dead deal. We're there to uphold the zoning. Get the 8 feet or get the zoning relief from the zoning. Or get the variance re requirement there. <clears throat> and what well, but you know, I think actually that's the, the question. The history of that is where you really start getting into some problems. And, and I think you hit it on the head that you might say, okay, we look at this site plan, you have a frontage issue, we can't even start to look at the site until you go to ZBA and deal with that frontage issue. But ZBA will say, well, we're not comfortable giving a, zone, a frontage variance without looking at the density issues and all of the kind of things that typically come up in either a site plan or a special permit review. And, and during that... So now you have the ZBA undertaking a broader so, analysis. A big, a big part of our jurisdiction. And then so it comes back to us and we're like, but we still, like in one of the cases I'm thinking of, it went off to ZBA, it came to us for an informal. Went off to ZBA for some setback and frontage type things and maybe some other zoning relief. And then when it came back to us, it was completely designed, and now people are saying, well, we can't really change it, because if we change it all in site plan, then we have to go back to change our variances. And then at the end of the day, you're left with a situation where the bylaws give us the permission to just outright deny a mixed use in the center protection. And now, but now you have a developer standing in front of you who just spent a year and umpteen thousands of dollars going through ZBA getting variances, and are we going to sit there and just say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to allow mixed use because we don't like the way the plan developed, or we don't like the the final plan. We don't think it meets with the, what the bylaws were designed to accomplish in that district. Well, is this where the communication issue you brought forward at the start of the meeting comes into play, where you send somebody, you know, with a committee of two or three, or, you know, as long as you don't send them a majority to the, to the board meeting. I was just going to ask if that's legal. Which? Is, is the planning board allowed to give their feedback on an informal in writing to zoning? For example, we feel they need the extra eight feet for a variance, but we would need to see it encroach into something else. Can they put it in writing, or is that... Well, I mean, the you know the the informal, I guess there has to be a clear understanding of what the ground rules are for an informal. I mean, because... If they're going to put something in writing, I think if you're a developer, you're thinking, gee, this is starting to feel a little formal. Yeah. But on the other hand... But in it, other it, words, instructing ZBA as to what their expectations are. Well, no, well but now it's almost like we the, ruled the, it. Well, that, that's the, the problem. But we wouldn't but, even begin to review it until that point. Well, the variance is special transfer change before, and they have to, uh, yeah, before, and... There's no informal to it either one of those because you can't legally go before the ZBA and ask, can we possibly do this? It's either a yes or a but, no. But, but this again gets jurisdictional where you have a developer 
we'll tell the developer, go get the variances you need for this project. There are two variances requested. They go before ZBA, and six months later, they've got four variances given, and the project has turned into a site plan. And then it comes back to us, and we say, this isn't anywhere near the spirit of the bylaw that just required one or two variances. You've given them way more than you would have ever given them. And it could have worked within the scope of the bylaw. We get it. We get it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the upshot I got out of this was, but if we see this developing, it's not a legal issue for us to go on record with the ZBA by having a public me meeting that's um, joint mm -hmm. with the ZBA's public hearing. Like we could go even there as the zone, as the as the planning board, right. and say this has only been before us in an informal, but we want to make sure the ZBA understands what our concerns are here with the direction the, the ZBA is taking. The ZBA and the developer. Yeah. Let the developer know as well. And I, we can I, do that. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. You could, you could send a, a, a delegation, or you could have a full quorum at every single ZBA meeting also, yeah. as long as it's supposed to. Yeah. As, long as, we, as long as we can get the members to show up. I mean, right. keep in mind everyone's volunteering their time, and we've been meeting um, almost every week. Yeah. And I would love yeah. comments. But we have never received the comments. Okay. Well, what are the comments? We should do this uh, in a little less formal sense yeah. because I, I think there's more dialogue to be had. I mean, it was nice to have the training, Joel, but uh, I actually thought it was going to be more of a, a communication discussing, discussion as it turned out in the end. But now we've run out of time, so we should continue okay. at some point soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Brian, it has been 20 years. Yes, yeah. It has been 20 years. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you all. Nice to see you all again. Thank you, Joel. We really appreciate you coming in. and uh, happy to do it. I think all of us learned a little bit about uh, everything that we talked about. And, uh, Good. Uh, I'm glad to have you here. Thanks. Yeah. Nice here. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of the summer. Any other questions from board members to uh, go before you leave? So. Yes, one. Joe, sure. would it make sense if other towns done this, combined those two committees into one committee? No, I've never seen that. Would that be illegal? Well, it, it's not so much that it would be illegal. What you're talking about essentially is you need a separate planning board and a separate zoning board. I mean, there are laws. For instance, Becky referred to one point, subdivision control. That's only done by planning boards. Variances can only be issued by zoning boards. I mean, what you can do in your zoning bylaw is put all of the zoning permits into one board, I guess, and then, I mean, there was an allusion to this earlier, and if you caught it, but the site plan review review used to be done by the zoning board, and at, uh, at a town meeting, I mean, you probably remember, it was a pretty big deal for planning and zoning boards. The planning board uh, snatched site plan review away from the zoning board. It was, it was just the zoning bylaw amendment. But by amending the zoning bylaw, and I'm not suggesting this, but to answer your question, you could put all of the permits into the zoning board if you wanted to. Because you can't move the variance over to the planning board by statute. You, you could by special act, actually. So, theoretically, you could put all those permits into one board, I guess. You need special legislation to do it. Do nobody's nobody's ever done it. Well, you know, it's a good question. I. I it have an appeal board that would be appealing its own decision. Well, there's cases. one. There's one drawback. Yeah, and that that wouldn't the work. The separation of but powers. Well, uh, that's has been helpful. That's why no one's done it. That's a, a major reason, I'm sure. Yeah, that, that's the sort. Of, it's more of a philosophical thing is having the two different boards because you get a zoning board that's not detail oriented. They just adjudicate. They get, you know, they they get appeals of decisions that have come through the building inspector, where they get these variances that are somewhat court like. Whereas the planning board, as you gather, they get into the nitty gritty. You know, so you get people on the planning board who like to look at plans and look at where the shrubbery is going to go and, and look at where the building should be properly designed on the site and the access issues. They talk to engineers and 
that sort of thing, and then, which is consistent with what they do um, with uh, reviewing subdivision plans. So, I mean, as Dan mentioned, there's there's some feeling, I guess, that it's kind of nice to have some division of responsibilities that way. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, yes, what, I, what I got out <coughs> of this is there seems to be a disconnect on what is a variance and how should it be granted. We hear quotations from zoning bylaw defining a variance and an accusation that you know, to use that word that it's not being followed. So I would think these two boards have got to get together. What is an acceptable definition of a variance? And then they said when somebody comes in and just wants to discuss a proposed project that they would like to do, but it's unofficial, and the planning board said, yeah, well, okay, but I can tell you right now, they're going to have to get a couple of variances from the zoning board. And then I think they said that a couple of months later, they get a set of plans that has a lot of things in it that they that now they have to deal with. Well, I think it would be really wise. First of all, it's obvious, is poor communication mm -hmm. that has to be done between these two boards. Yeah, I think that's the key. And I think it's a good idea on certain projects that the planning board may want to designate one of their members on a particular project to sit down with the zoning board when they're when the zoning board is going to conduct their business on that particular project. And they can speak up if they see or hear something that they don't believe is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, the Board of Selectmen has assigned a selectman to go to a couple of meetings yeah. to stay on top of what's going on and come back and report to the rest of us. So, a couple of things I get out of it. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Can I ask you uh, to, to kind of file on Boo's point just a little further, though? The, Z, the ZBA and hearing of variance, um, can they, when a set of plans is presented to them for a variance, uh, they have on the Washington Street project, they have sat down with the developer and discussed density, changed uh, housing units around. Uh, change commercial units around uh, rather than the black and white variance that they came in for. They, as Brian was accurate, they literally changed the plans. Uh, and then the variance noted those changes as conditions. Uh, so is, is that a difference of philosophy or is that a legal matter? They can or they cannot do that? Well, keep in mind, so it, it, it's not philosophy or legal. I mean, legally they can do it, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't the zoning board dictating any of that. And, and, you know, you all were much closer to the details than I were, but my understanding is that if there was any source generating all of this, it was the abutters. I mean, I think that a certain plan came in, the abutters came to the meetings and said, you know, we don't like this, whatever. I mean, I, I, again, I don't know the details, but my understanding is that the changes if there were three parties involved, the zoning board was the least in charge of the changes. It came from the developer in conversations with the neighbors who had certain feelings about it and worked out something that everybody got together on. Well, I believe that's accurate. Uh, I, I suppose my question should be should have been asked, uh, is it legal not so much for the, the ZBA to do it, to, but to be, to be done in a ZBA meeting under a variance that came in for a certain specific variance. Yeah. So yes. You're saying you just act on the question at the end and don't add anything to it. Look, a good, good lawyer variance. never answers a question he wasn't asked. Why are they? Uh, he doesn't know the answer to it. But, but here's the thing. I mean, if you think about it in the big scheme of things, here's a project proposed in a neighborhood. Shouldn't the neighbors have a big say on it? I mean, I think, you know, that's essentially who you want to be sure to set it. I mean, you want the town at large, but typically what you hear most from are the immediate neighbors. And sometimes, you know, this board has an opinion about it. I mean, generally as a matter of economic development, 
the town administrator likes to see new development come in. Um, so, I, I mean, it sounds to me like the project was actually fairly organic. And if it, it turns out that as it got modified, it needed more variance, I mean, from, you know, from my perspective, from what I've seen, I, I don't see that as a big issue. I mean, it, 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 and just one more point, Bill, just back to um, the issue, and Lou, you sort of raised it about, you know, in a sense, the way you put it, Lou, and the way some of the comments were, is there a right and wrong way to approach variances. I think most zoning boards are fairly flexible. I mean, you don't want them giving away the store. And as I mentioned the example of a couple of towns I'm familiar with where basically we don't issue variances. But those are the extremes. And essentially, you know, if you want to see some level of development occur, and it's got to be the right kind of project, you're going to need that kind of flexibility. I mean, it's just a sort of a so that's, that's important. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, doesn't it make sense to have an informal hearing on both sides? So, if they if they went to if we were, if we were to develop something as a plan for the town to say this is what we suggest that, you know that you do instead of going on one board or the other board or whatever, wouldn't it make sense to do something informal with the planning board and do something informal with? Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals or whatever, and then say if they're going to have a public hearing, that these boards get together for one public hearing and do the one public hearing, and now everybody can have input into it? You know, I'm it saying that we probably would not approve that if you allowed this. And we probably wouldn't approve this if you... You know what I'm saying? That's where it seems like it needs to go. Is everybody has to be there somewhere rather than waiting two or three months and saying, no, 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 we're not going to, we're not going to do that. That's, uh, that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to allow that. And then, so you get the boards into fighting or whatever, back and forth to each other. It only, it only makes sense if someone walks in here and says something informal to us, and it's very informal. And we could say, yep, you know what, you need a couple of variances, you need this and that or whatever. So if they go informally to the other board and get something informal from them and then have a public hearing, they'd have all the information. The, the attorney or the engineer would have all the information from both boards to make a decision on what they wanted to do, and then present the plan at a public hearing. The, I, I, that's very logical, but the, the missing element in that is the neighbors. When you get a big project, the neighbors turn out. Right. And, and again, my sense of the particular project that's you know, in the backs of everybody's minds is a project where I sense the neighbors played a pretty, pretty big role, and that's kind of the X factor. You don't really, it's not predictable, you don't know. Right, but everybody's on the same page. Yes. Because but now, it's a, now the, the planning board is not having a public hearing and listening to the neighbors getting ticked off about something. And then there's another another public hearing, you know, through the planning board that, you know, that they're having and, and the zoning board isn't invited or whatever. So now you get these different boards not knowing what any, either one of them are doing. Yeah, yeah. It, it would make sense to have one public hearing on it and, and put all that information in. Together. Right. Yeah, and I'm agreeing with you completely. I guess I'm just moving out six months. Something yeah. may change along the line, right. and that's where you get into needing to check back in periodically because, I mean, clearly from the comments we heard from the planning board, they're, you know, a little peeved that the project changed so dramatically. And I think they, if, if there had been some communication along the way, they wouldn't have been so surprised by that turn of events. Well, there's another wild card in the mix is that you've got the Conservation Commission who may or may not agree with the site plan of yeah. people given by the, uh, by the planning board because of, you know, wetlands issues or you know, uh, drainage issues and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, but doesn't that make sense also if they have them go in front of conservation on an informal hearing? Yeah, that's what I say. I think and that's then the, the way one to do public it. hearing, all yeah. the information could be brought in? Yeah, you know, the Wetlands Protection Act actually... Um, doesn't require, I can't remember if it's the, the act itself or the wetlands regulations that require that it, that, that permit be issued last. But obviously the wetlands flagging has to happen first because, so they'll do that. Uh, yeah, they'll do that then, with a notice of intent, I think. Just, uh, yeah, just to get, get the wetlands get delineated. Right. So that. So you know how much acreage or square footage you're dealing with. Right, and, and to keep, obviously to keep the work out of the wetlands. So that probably happens at the beginning regardless. The, the permit comes at the end. 
Well, it's important, it's important to know uh, that a variance for FZBA can morph into, into something different because it's organic and it's it's part of the process and it's legal. It's and, and knowing that, then it's a matter of ongoing communication. So the, the ZBA sends out a notice for every meeting that they're having. Uh, the planning board gets those, and and then it's further communication. The planning board has an interest in a particular project, and the ZBA knows that, and the ZBA could put out a message to the uh, the zoning board, uh, the, the planning board, that we're meeting tonight, and here's our agenda. But I need you could read the agenda online, but you need to know that you're interested in this. Come on by, because we will be discussing this and deliberating. Uh, so the, the communications between the two boards in that particular project uh, were, were a little lax. And then on this board, too, because uh, we knew that, that that was an important um, uh, discussion going on. Uh, we, we could have uh, alerted some folks to pay a little more attention. Uh, so well, it's, it's uh, coming upon everyone to communicate a little better, especially if you take a great interest in the project. That's the same project that the uh, planning board came to the selectmen and asked for attorneys, for oh, yeah. an attorney to, to uh, represent them um, and fight against the... Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I think it was a productive evening. Yeah, too bad we didn't get the rest of the zoning board, but what can we do? Yeah, good. Tough time of year to like Yeah. Right, but it was, it was worth doing, I think. Clearly, we all learned a little something. Well, I think the big thing is that it's recorded and that if other people want to see it, um, especially about a lot of the things that you addressed early on, is, is, um, is going to be, be very beneficial for all Good. Of the time. Yeah, great. Okay, well, I'll let you get to the rest of your meeting. Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.